Please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your generous gifts. Forgive us when we, through comparing ourselves to others, reject or begrudge those gifts. Help us to look only to you and see the wondrous gifts that you have received us as the blessings that they are. May the meditation of our collective hearts and the words of my mouth be faithful and well-pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Do you ever compare yourselves to other people? I definitely do. When I was thinking about this theme for the text, what came to my mind was my experience on Vicarage. When I found out where I was going, um, for those of you who don't know, there's a service in the chapel, and you don't know, just like anybody else who's watching the service, has no idea where you're going to be living for the next year of your life. They call out your name, they tell you you're going to be a vicar at this church, and they hand you an envelope, and that's where you go. But after you find out where you're going, you usually get a little information about it. You contact the pastor who's going to be supervising your internship year, and you kind of find a little bit about the students who served as vicars before you. And that comes with benefits because they can share some insights with you, but it also comes with the inevitable comparison. So on my vicarage, I followed after two guys who were some of the smartest students on campus, the sort of students that could open up their Greek New Testaments and just read out of it like it was English. And I felt the comparison coming on. Am I going to teach as well as these guys? Am I going to preach as well as these guys? Because I certainly can't just open my Greek New Testament without any aid or resources and read it like it's English. Am I going to be liked by the, the college students in the campus ministry that I did as much as they were? Will the congregation respect me in the same way they respected them? If you're being honest, this probably sounds fairly familiar to you. The comparison game is a common human experience, and it doesn't have to be about work or professional skill. It can be about looks. It can be about money. It can really be about anything. You've probably even found yourself at times laughing after the fact at the sort of ridiculous things that you spend time comparing yourself to others about. And sometimes it really is ridiculous. So as we get into this parable that Jesus shares with us in His Word today, I want you to think of who do you compare yourself to? Maybe if you're in school, you compare yourself to a classmate or a friend. Are you as well liked as them? Do you have as many friends as they do? Do you get better grades than they do? Are you better at sports than they are? Or maybe you're a parent and you compare yourself to other parents, and you look around and you think, man, their kids are well-behaved. What am I doing wrong? Or maybe you're thinking, well, their kids aren't so well-behaved. I must be doing a pretty good job because my kids don't do that. Or their marriage looks really great, not like mine. Or, ugh, their marriage doesn't look so great. Mine's pretty good. We must be doing pretty well. Or maybe you compare your looks to other people. You're self-conscious about the way you feel that you look, your physical appearance, better or worse. Or maybe you compare your wealth or your success or your accomplishments or your degrees or this or that or the other. The list goes on. If there's something to compare yourself with somebody else about, a sinful human being is going to find it, as ludicrous as it may be. Well, the truth is, we spend a lot of our time and energy, more than we want to admit, measuring ourselves and what we think we are worth in comparison to other people. You probably don't have to go too far back in your mind to find one. Maybe it happened this morning when you walked into church. Maybe it's happening right now as you're listening to my sermon. Maybe it happened yesterday, or maybe it happened all three of those times. Well, from what Jesus tells us in our reading today, this is a problem. It's not a problem because just because you're disobeying God when you're looking to measure yourself by some other standard than the one that He sets. 
But it's also a problem for you, the one who's doing the comparing. Because either you end up with a sinful pride in your own accomplishments and worth, or you're crushed by your perceived inadequacies and you feel unworthy. Now, the church isn't immune to this, as many of you probably know, but I'm going to share with you a tale of two church members that I have encountered in my experience in the church. These two church members were both part of the founding families of the congregation that they were in. They probably gave a significant amount of money to the church to help its budget and its ministries. They also gave generously of their time and their talents. They served on church council and on many different boards. So I want you to keep those two church members in mind as we go to the gospel text today. We're going to come back to them and see where this really applies, not only to these two church members that I'm speaking of, but really to us as well. So to understand our gospel reading for today, we need a little bit of context. In the verses preceding the uh, first verse of chapter 20 in Matthew, at the end of chapter 19, Jesus is confronted by a rich young man who asks him what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus says, well, follow the commandments. He's like, I got that. I do those. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Got that. I do those. And he said, okay, well, if, if this is really what you're concerned about, then go and sell all the things that you have and follow me. In a way, the same invitation he gave to Peter and James and John and all of his 12 disciples. And yet the story ends with the rich young man going away sad because he had many possessions. And then we get the, the line, we get a few aphorisms from Jesus. One is that it's easier for a needle to go through the eye of a camel, or reverse that, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then we get a line right before our text today that frames this whole parable because it's almost the exact same line at the very end of our reading today, which is that many of those who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And then we get to our text for today. So Peter has a question for God, for Jesus, after he hears this exchange with the rich young man. He says in verse 27 of chapter 19, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? For he sees that the demand that Jesus makes of the rich young man, they say, Peter says to himself, and he speaks on behalf of the disciples, well, we did that. We gave up everything to follow you. We left behind our families and our, and our jobs and our worldly possessions, and we followed you. So, what do we get out of it? pretty human question. And if we're being honest, if we've been thinking about the last couple of weeks, Peter's track record on questions isn't so great, right? But this one is sort of interesting. Jesus responds as if this is a partially valid question on Peter's part. Jesus says something quite surprising. He says to them that the disciples are going to have a unique role in the day of judgment, that they're going to sit on the twelve thrones and judge the tribes of Israel. Now, Jesus' answer to Peter's question may raise more questions for us than it does answers, but one thing is clear, that the twelve disciples have some specific role on Judgment Day that is unique to them. But then Jesus goes even further in His response to Peter's question, and He says that those who have given up homes and relationships and their businesses for the sake of My name on the final day, they will receive a hundredfold and eternal life. In other words, all those disciples of Jesus who suffer loss on the last day, they will get their recompense in an abundance of blessings and eternal life. And that is truly the hope of the Christian disciple. Our hope is not in the abundance of God's blessings in this life, although His generosity does bring those, but in what is to come on that day. 
So now we get to the parable that Jesus is speaking in response to Peter's question. The parable of the workers in the vineyard, you've probably heard it before, but it serves to explain exactly what Jesus means when he concludes his answer to Peter by saying, but many who are first will be last and the last first. And I have to say, after really digging into the text, I think my father misapplied this verse when I got in the front of the food line after church on Sundays. I don't think that's what it's talking about. But it starts with the similar phrase that the last couple of weeks the parables have started with, which is, for the kingdom of heaven is like. You see, since Jesus has revealed what the Messiah has come to do, He's been endeavoring to teach His disciples The kingdom that He is bringing into the world through His life, death, and resurrection is not the same as the world they live in. We heard it in the Old Testament reading today from Isaiah 55, right? My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And so when Jesus teaches about the kingdom of heaven, there is usually shocking revelations to our human mind. So here's how the parable goes. There's a master of a house, and he's trying to find laborers to work in his vineyard. And so he goes out early in the morning and finds some workers. And he agrees to pay them a denarius a day. And a denarius was a standard day's wage at the time. So it was a perfectly proper amount to be offered to pay for a day's work. They agree to it, and they go and work in his vineyard. Then it says he goes out in the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour and does so again, and the agreement there is that he will pay them what is right to pay them. In other words, he's not going to pay them less than they deserve. And then the key group is the eleventh hour. So it's near the end of the day, and he goes out and he sees that there are men that have been standing about all day idle, and he says to them, why are you standing about idle? And they say, well, nobody hired us. And so he says, well, go work in the vineyard as well. Well, then time comes, the day is over, and pay needs to happen. And so he calls the foreman to gather all the laborers who've helped out in the vineyard to pay them, and he starts with those who came last and ends with those who came first. So we have a denarius for those who came first, what is right or just for the third, the sixth, the ninth, and then the eleventh hour, he doesn't really specify. He just says, go work in the vineyard. Well, the eleventh hour group comes up and they, to their great joy and surprise, they get paid a full day's wage for an hour of work. He gives them a denarius. And you can imagine they're all waiting in a line, you know, the guys at the, the front, they look kind of well rested and not worn out, and the guys in the back are sweaty and dirty, and they've been working out in the field all day, and they're thinking to themselves, like any of us would probably think, wow, this is a generous guy. I wonder how much more he's going to give me. I mean, if I calculate that out, they worked for an hour, so I'm looking at like 12 denarius or something like this, right? Very normal human way to think. Yet Jesus is about to turn the world upside down again for His disciples, They get up there, and the master of the house pays them what was agreed, a denarius. And then they begin to grumble. Notice that when he gave them the denarius to these people who barely worked at all, they didn't have any problem with that until they got the same. They started playing the comparison game. They stopped looking at the master or remembering the agreement that they made with him, but instead were looking to the other workers and thought, we are better than they are, for we worked longer than they have. That's the way it works in this world. But Jesus is telling His disciples, in my world, that's not the way things work. And then when they grumble, they say, why have you not paid us more? And the master of the house says, I haven't wronged you. I paid you what we agreed. And I paid you not only what we agreed, but what is appropriate for the work that you have done. And then he kind of turns their grumbling around and says, are you going to begrudge my generosity because I chose to give this person more than they deserved? You see, the master didn't 
mistreat the workers who are out there in the field all day. They got paid appropriately. But it wasn't fair because he was generous with those who worked less. Aren't we often the same? We look around ourselves in this world, and the difference in worth makes sense. But if we're being honest, we'd like it to still be there, at least when it works in our favor in the kingdom of heaven. Now, if I find myself in that 11th hour group, I'm really excited about the fact that I'm not getting paid what I earned, because I didn't earn much, right? But we're like the same, we're the same as this first group in the early morning who've been working throughout the day. We think, don't I deserve more for what I've done? Well, you remember my two founding church members. One of them simply did the things that they were doing out of obedience to Christ. Now, obviously, he's not perfect, so I'm sure there was some selfish motivation in some of his activities, but what really came through wasn't that. Because most of the things he tried to do, he tried to do without getting any sort of notice or notoriety for himself. He didn't want to be known at least not for doing things. The other did them, I think, at least partially for that reason. But there were a couple of experiences I had with this other person that it became clear that they were also doing this because they thought that it gave them greater standing in the congregation. A stronger voice about decisions because, well, I pay more money than most people here, or I've been here longer, or I give more of my time. And if we're being honest, myself included, we think those thoughts too. And sometimes we act on them. There's a lot of temptation to think in similar ways. For a pastor, it goes something like this. Well, I spend a lot of my time on holy things. Why don't people just get it? It's their own fault. I'm better. Not true. And it turns out that as disciples, we're called to live already as if we are in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is describing, because His very presence in our lives is the presence of that kingdom. The essence of our witness about the King Jesus is as citizens of His kingdom, because our lives look different. The way we treat other people looks different because He has called us and made us His own. So it turns out what Jesus is telling His disciples, just after He's informed them that they are given a special role on the day of judgment, He tells this parable to warn them not to become prideful of their position. Because it turns out in the kingdom of heaven, the amount of your works or sacrifice are not accounted to you as righteousness. And if we really look at that parable, those those members of people who go to work in the field, they're described as laborers. That is their job. And you can see what happens to the ones that aren't hired. They basically have no identity. They just stand in place idly in the marketplace and do nothing. It turns out that their role and their life and their purpose and all that they have are given to them by the master of the house. He gives them their work and their purpose and their identity and their reward. So it is somewhat ironic that in verse 12 of our our gospel today, the first group of workers is actually right in their complaint to the master of the house. They say, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. That's true. That's exactly what the master of the house has done. The first group just doesn't realize that this is good news. How is, so the last will be first and the first will be last, actually just? That seems unfair. Well, if that would be your complaint, that's true. It is unfair. But we've heard for the last couple of weeks that the kingdom of heaven is an unfair place. In the kingdom of heaven, the innocent dies for the guilty. In the kingdom of heaven... 
People don't pay what they owe. In the kingdom of heaven, today we learn, we all have the same righteousness, the same gift that has been given to us, and it is not given on account of how long we've been working or how much we've sacrificed or the amount of money we've given to the church or whatever reason we come up with to think that we deserve more. Because everything that we are and have is from God. Whether we started at the beginning of the day or at the end, our righteousness is the same. It is a righteousness of Jesus, given freely as a gift of faith. This is good news. Because the truth is, if we were going to go with the images in the parable, sometimes we feel like the first group, but sometimes we also feel like the last. And we must be on guard against both, because our righteousness comes from Christ. Because our righteousness comes from Christ, our deeds and our, our sacrifices are in His name and to His glory, not to our name and for our glory. And because we have righteousness in Christ, when we fail, when we feel guilt over our sin, we're not crushed, and we don't feel unworthy because our righteousness comes from Christ. How then, if all that we have and that we are comes from God, Can we begrudge God, the master of the house, when He chooses to be generous with others who do not deserve His gifts? It brings to mind the parable we meditated on regarding the unforgiving servant. So, dear friends in Christ, while the blessings of God aren't given in the same amounts in this life, that's okay. The good news of Jesus today is that in the kingdom of heaven, all is equal. All is equal in an abundance far greater than anyone deserves, whether you are out there throughout the heat of the day or not. It is just and it is good and it is given to you freely as a gift of grace. So this parable isn't about who is worthy. It is about God's generosity to those who He calls to faith. But it's also a warning to those who want to begrudge God's generosity, who want to find their worth and their righteousness in their own deeds and efforts rather than in God. Jesus is partially saying this so that His twelve disciples who've been told that they're going to have a role on Judgment Day don't become prideful and think of themselves better than others, for the righteousness that Peter has is the same righteousness that you have, a righteousness from Christ. So I have good news for you today. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in Jesus, God has generously given you all things. In Him, you have salvation. In Him, you have the forgiveness of your sins. In Him, you have eternal life. And by His very own words in Matthew chapter 19, by Him you have the blessings of all the things lost in this life for the sake of His name and many more. So do not begrudge His generosity by, complain, by, by playing the comparison game. Keep your eye fixed on the Master, on the King. And instead, marvel at His generosity and grace in the gifts that He gives you and others. In the name of Jesus, amen.